walking the streets of Mabantua Alice Springs in the grips of a lockdown. We've seen some antisocial behaviour, um, criminal damage, you know, and horror and behaviour by some of our society. Um, so it's those things that have the cumulative effects of those over time have resulted in where we are now. It's week two of a youth curfew banning people aged under 18 from the CBD after dark. The glass is full, it's overflowed. Um, the community's spoken, they want help. But the curfew hasn't completely deterred children with dozens coming into contact with the nightly patrols. At a camping store just outside the CBD, owner Carly Anderson says the emergency measures haven't stopped violent crime. Both my husband and I got on the phone to triple zero to let them know someone was in the store. Um, and I just thought, not again. It wasn't the first time? No. It was the second break-in in just over 12 months. The first thing they did was jump over the counter and look for keys to the motorbike that we have on the the floor and I guess from there they've noticed the tills and they've decided to take the tills. One of them got smashed on the floor behind the counter. And then they've come back in through that door, even though the alarm was going off, to smash the cabinets. So a lot of the stuff they took was knives and a couple of crossbows. The horrifying invasion happened late last month, after the curfew had been called. Three young people have since been arrested, one just 14 years old. We're outside of the curfew zone. People in the CBD aren't being broken into and it's pushed out into the suburbs. But in saying that, I think that it would have happened regardless of a curfew or not. Um, I'm just having to use a leftover tray until it's all replaced. The Andersons say more than $100,000 in damage, coupled with the personal toll, has left them on the brink of leaving town. I feel torn because I drive home and I get to see the ranges um, and I get to see it in different lights of the day and I don't want to not see that. I don't want to not be here. I don't want to, I don't want to have to take my kids out of here for them to feel safe. I don't want to leave. I came back for a reason. I've built my whole life here. Um, but it's very, it's very hard to want to stay when this keeps happening. When does it end? Like, when is enough? It was just before 2am on March 8th when police were alerted to a stolen car driving erratically towards the town centre. Nine people were inside when the vehicle rolled, crushing an 18-year-old. Police allege the remaining passengers fled as their friend Kumanjai Petrick lay there dying. Two weeks later, tensions between families erupted after a cultural ceremony for the teenager's death. Oh, she's got a brick. This Alice Springs Tavern smashed with rocks, feet and fists as the group searched for someone inside. The 
have seen large gatherings of people, unfortunately, um, in public areas fighting, um, and they're in various age groups. Um, it's not the town of Alice Springs. It's not the town that we want. The curfew triggered in its wake. At Larapinta Town Camp on Alice Springs' fringes, grieving relatives say their loved one wasn't just a young man lost too early in a stolen car crash. He was happy, friendly, and lovable little person he was. And he was my first grandson. He was a pretty strong man. To stand up for his little brother. The death of the Eastern Arunda teen, whose elders have asked to be referred to as Kumanjai Petrick for cultural reasons, has left behind a three year old son and a large family shattered. Now, since when our great great grandson. I'm to grow up, we won't see him again. The 18 year old was largely raised by his grandmothers. First time he, he became a father, we were all proud. I feel devastated. Because it's the devastation that lies on, lies on the family altogether. Kumanjai's uncle fears a lack of engagement and education is creating a lost generation. The country needs to listen because we need things out here for the youth to keep them occupied, to keep them off the streets. Because the youth, they're the next generation, the next future leaders. It's a call echoed by those across the Territory searching for long-term solutions to its social woes. I think it's just like the way to Uluru as well. Did Had it been that? It's Walpuri man JD's last day before he finishes this rehab program. You feeling all right? Yeah, I'm feeling all right. Happy to go home or? Happy to go back. I'm going to miss you too when you chill out. Alongside caseworkers, the young people are heading out bush. Central Eastern Arunda woman Armani Francois works at the drug and alcohol service her grandfather helped start 25 years ago. Coming out to bush and, you know, feeling the breeze, feeling the sun, it's therapeutic to our clients and it's, it's really needed in our program um, because without it, We'll just be stuck in town and so many distractions in town, but out here it's so quiet and the silence speaks loud, yeah. A teenager herself, aged 18, Armani has watched the youth crime crisis in Alice Springs unfold around her. A lot of our youth are painted with the same brush. Not all of them go through the same things, but majority of the time they're very disadvantaged and they start on the back foot. All these little band-aids on, you know, big wounds that have huge solutions to them that, you know, could possibly take years. It's not going to take days to fix it. Now 21 years old, JD has been coming into contact with the law since he was 15. He's been convicted for break-ins and assault. I don't know what I was doing, you know. Yeah. It's got into my trouble. Just made a mistake. Yeah. yeah. Time made a change and make the right choices, stay out of trouble. He's at the end of a 16-week stint with the program, which received $2.5 million in emergency Commonwealth funding when crime spiked last year. My plan is to go back home and start making right, right choices and it's a fun job. JD says the program has set him up with an ID and bank account. It's all right. They support you and just help you. JD's 
reasonably typical. He's not some drug crazed gangster wannabe delinquent that you see. He's, he's a young man. He's figuring out how he's going to fit in in the world. And he's coming to the end of his time here and he's done pretty well. Jock McGregor heads the Bush Mob program. He concedes there's only so much they can do to help steer young Aboriginal people onto the right track. It's by giving people the tools to be able to handle it themselves. We can't fix the greater issue. And the greater issue is that everything's not OK. You go um, to some of the communities or even some of the houses and you go, I wouldn't want to stay here either. I don't have, say, family, there's not regularly food, there's not regularly power. You still make people responsible for what they do, but you understand what brings them to that point and how you can prevent it in the future. We need to identify it, you know, as Aboriginal people that, yeah, we are doing wrong things, yeah, we are doing this, but how do we fix it? I think as, you know, non-Indigenous Australians, it's about being allies in that space. It's about, you know, staying hopeful with us, trying to help us, trying to be patient with us, you know, seeing that, you know, there is light at the end of the tunnel.